Thank you, Julia, and uh, welcome to week seven. Uh, we will be talking about agricultural and urban catchments today. We have four or five of each, and um, these will be six minute talks as Kara Webster referred to this as uh, catchment speed dating. Um, but the, uh, everyone has enjoyed this format, I think, for the most part, and uh, we will be um, culminating next week with our final seminar where we will actually be talking about ideas to promote catchment science, keep the enterprise going, and ideas for collaboration. Um, so I want to turn it over to Steve now to talk about how we're going to handle questions today. Great. Thank you and welcome everyone. It's great to have you here. All the questions will come in from the audience via the chat. The panelists will see those um, chats and they can respond to them. So please do keep questions coming throughout the talks. We hope to have a minute or two after each individual talk. If not, panelists may be able to respond via chat during the next series of, of talks, or we might be able to cover the discussion point at the end. We do hope to have a 15 minute discussion at the end. So also please provide us with more general questions to present to the whole panel or particular, particular groups of panelists. So please keep the information rolling in here. Um, we greatly appreciate everyone who is part of the dialogue in this in this uh, seminar series. Okay, so I guess next slide, Julia, we'll look at our catchment map. And so, okay, now we have a lot more yellow than red. Yellow are catchments that have already presented in the series and red are the catchments that we'll hear about today. So we'll see we're all in the Northern Hemisphere today. Um, that's good. Do we have our map of the SI contributions, special issue contributions? That's this one? Yes. So, so these red dots are uh, contributions to the special issue and hydrological processes, which many of you have contributed to and that we're moving right along with proving papers right now. So we'll go to the next and um, talk about our first speaker, Magdalena Fiorosa from Sweden. We'll start us off on the agricultural part of our series today. Go ahead, Magdalena. Thank you very much. Hi there, uh, my name is Magdalena Fiorosa. I'm from Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and uh, today I'm going to briefly talk to you about the catchment, which is very close to my heart and uh, my students <laughs> as well. Uh, and uh, this is a place where we study both hydrology and biogeochemistry. Uh, so next one, please. Uh, the catchment is small. Uh, it's under 10 square kilometers. It's headwater catchment with clay soils that are mostly drained. Um, it's uh, predominantly agricultural arable soils, but it has uh, high concentrations of phosphorus, both dissolved uh, total phosphorus, sediments and nitrate. So huge risk for eutrophication, and this is the reason why um, there is a lot of uh, focus on best management practices in this catchment. Next, please. So our, where we come here into the picture is we try to answer questions related to pollution transfers. So finding and identifying sources, um, trying to understand how they connect to the stream network uh, and what's the impact. So we have uh, infrastructure that consists of uh, high resolution monitoring, both for flow and water quality. Um, we have 15 minutes measurements of turbidity along the stream network as well. Um, and uh, what we're interested mainly is to understand what's the role of hydrological extremes, legacy sources, um, what's the role of sedimentary suspension in the stream network, and uh, what are the links between biogeochemistry and hydrology. Uh, one of the final things is the effectiveness of best management practices, both on field and in the stream network. Next, please. So some key results. Uh, here you have at the top hydrograph with identified storm events. As you can see, it's quite flashy response. Uh, you have corresponding turbidity, phosphorus and nitrate concentrations. 
Um, and if you look at this little graph on the right hand side, you see that individual storm events are responsible for uh, most of the of the phosphorus load in this case. So um, concentrations are high, but also the combination with the flow is important. And I want to point you to the storm event 22. It's a minuscule increase in flow discharge. Yeah, right there. But you can see it created enormous response, um, both uh, in uh, sediments, phosphorus, but also especially for, for the nitrate. Uh, so this is just exemplifies the importance of uh, extreme events in the future you know, and how drought can affect concentrations that we observe in the stream. Next, please. So um, in conclusion, uh, we are very interested in collaboration. We want to hear from you, um, especially if you're interested in um, modeling water travel time distributions. We're also interested in concentration discharge relationships and interactions with hyperaic zone. So how the biogeochemistry hyperaic zone affects water quality in this small stream. One final point is uh, we are holding a um, workshop on high resolution water quality uh, monitoring analysis. It's um, in the end of May and the beginning of June. We have super um, selection of keynote speakers with James Kirshner, Nandita Basso and Helen Jarvi. So if you're interested in, in joining, you know, this is online event. Feel free to um, go to the website or just email me. And in general, if you have any questions or ideas, you know, how we can take this research forward, we will love, love to hear from you. Thanks. Magda, we have plenty of time for questions. I would encourage any of the audience members to post their questions now. Um, quickly, can you remind us when your catchments were started and comment on data availability, if you will? Sure. Uh, so uh, underlying data is uh, from end of 80s. So, so we have a time series from, from pretty much 1990s. And this is uh, every two weeks uh, water quality data and high resolution flow. And uh, since five years, we have uh, this high resolution setup of phosphorus, uh, nitrate and turbidity. So uh, 15 minutes measurements for, for that. If you're interested in any of those data sets, um, um, yeah, just, just get in touch. We published uh, most of, of, of the results from that. So we will be happy to share um, data sets and, and you know, take um, some new questions and, and see, uh, yeah, what we can do with the data. Great, Julia, do we have some more time? About 20, uh, 30 seconds. Okay. Um, in that time, Magda, can you answer what will be your approach to estimating travel times? And Rhett Jackson would like to know the answer to that. We have no idea. That's why we're looking for collaborators for that. Uh, uh, it's interesting catchment in the sense that it's uh, drained. So you would expect very quick response to the flow. Um, but there is also some, some legacy response. There is delay both in the subsurface and stream network. Um, so we would be very interested with, you know, some tracer studies, maybe uh, just to try to understand um, the water movement through this catchment. Great, thank you very much. We'll move on to the next speaker, but there are several more questions for you if you want to answer them through the chat. Our next speaker is Lindsay Yazerer. Go ahead, Lindsay. Hi. Um, so yeah, my name is Lindsay Yasser. I'm a research hydrologist with the US Department of Agriculture, Agricultural Research Service at the National Sedimentation Laboratory in Oxford, Mississippi. So today I'll be telling you about our long-term study watershed, Beasley Lake. Next slide, please. Just to give you a bit of context, it's located in the lower Mississippi River Basin, where you can see that um, yellow star. Next slide, please. So the landscape in the Lower Mississippi River Basin is a mosaic of agricultural row crop land, catfish ponds, and quite a bit of oxbow lakes with uh, riparian vegetation surrounding them. And Beasley Lake is, is a microcosm of that overall landscape. So you can see in the, the upper left-hand corner there, the watershed 
uh, the row crop land uh, with ditches feeding into the Oxbow Lake that's a cutoff of the Sunflower River and quite a bit of riparian vegetation in the middle of the watershed. Next slide, please. And land use in this watershed has changed over time. Conservation practices have been put in that have allowed us to study the effects of these practices. Um, one shift has been uh, changing from cotton to reduced till soybeans in most of the watershed. Also, the um, area north of the lake was taken out of production in 2003 and put into conservation reserve programs. So it's now a mixture of brush and trees. Then um, in 2005, there were some vegetated buffers put in near the lake and along the edge of some of the cropland. And then a sediment retention pond was put in in 2009. Next slide, please. So we monitor both water quality and quantity and a variety of terrestrial measurements um, throughout the watershed. Our longest record is lake water quality at three points within the lake, those triangles there. Um, we have a runoff, uh, edge of field runoff record that starts from about 2010. That's where those blue diamonds are located. There's a, a series of soil samples that have been taken at different times throughout the watershed. Those points aren't shown, but they're in a grid across the different habitats. We have lake cores that have been taken at various locations through several projects um, to look at nutrient dynamics, some 15 minute increment dissolved oxygen data in the last couple years. Lake bathymetry was taken uh, last year and then there's, there's also an earlier data set to compare to and climate data within the watershed from 2000. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of the types of research that's been conducted over time. So this, this project started as a Mississippi Delta Management Systems Evaluation Area in 1995. That's when the lake and watershed data um, collection began. There were a few studies on pesticide contamination and weed mapping. And then in 2005, this became part of the Conservation Effects Assessment Program, or SEEP, that some of you may have heard of. And there, was, there have been quite a few studies published on lake nutrient responses to integrated conservation practices. We recently published a study on surface runoff and the effects of with and without conservation practices. And there's been quite a bit of watershed modeling with the Anagnips model. Since 2015, this watershed has become part of the Long-Term Agroecosystem Research Network or LTAR. And so one of the studies um, that came out in 2020 looking at water budgets across the LTAR network includes this site. And some future studies that are that will probably be published in the next several years include algal nutrient limitations and denitrification rates and sediment nutrient fluxes. Next slide, please. You have a little over two minutes. So just a snapshot of some results. Looking at the runoff results on the left, you can see that the effect of the diff treatment practices runoff from the conservation or buffer has significantly lower suspended sediment. And we can see the effects of these in, in time in the lake water quality, with, which is that middle graph there, looking at total phosphorus over time. And you can see when the various practices went into place and it's decreased substantially, especially after the sediment retention pond was installed in 2009. And then again, that's reflected in the summer chlorophyll A values, which you see in the, the final plot there on the right, which shows chlorophyll increasing as this suspended sediment was decreasing and then once we had that, that big nutrient drop, it starts to decline as well. Next slide, please. Some of our ongoing challenges is to um, close the water budget in this watershed. We're looking at collecting more information on soil moisture and evapotranspiration, validating some watershed models and just improving our runoff um, measurements in general. Some of our success really been to evaluate the impacts of conservation practices on runoff water quality and lake water quality over time, watershed and um, water quality models. So that really helps us to, to simulate different practices. Um, in addition, looking at the, the sediment nutrient fluxes, both the release and uptake. Next slide, please. So if you want to access, especially the lake water quality data and the climate data and some of the management data that's available on the stewards database. And you can look at our paper in the special um, to see instructions on how to access that. If you're interested in collaborating with us, I have contact information for myself and Richard Lazat. And I just wanna thank all the many scientists, technicians, students and staff that's collect that have collected data and processed these samples over time because it's been a huge effort. I don't know if I have time for questions, but 
Lindsay, I'm not seeing any questions for you here right now. And I think uh, Joy is um, indicating that we need to move on to the next talk. So keep your eye posted on the chat. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Lindsay. Next up, we have Tylen Lee, who will take us over to the Czech Republic. Thanks, Jimmy. Yep. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Tari, a PhD student from CQE in Prague. Uh, thanks for organizing this seminar. I'm glad to be on behalf of our team to show you uh, our experiment catchment uh, with a great view of the Czech countryside. Uh, just to mention, our catchment is called Nyochice. Uh, it's named by a Czech village nearby. Um, the catchment is located in the Central Europe, about one hour by car from Prague. Just in case if you don't know where it is, you can check out the map on the right side. Uh, we established the catchment in 2011, uh, it's, so it's quite new and young catchment. Uh, also, the scale is quite small, about uh, half square kilometers. Uh, the elevation is about 400 meters above sea level. And the climate condition is uh, humidly continental. And more than 90% uh, of the land has been used for agriculture. And the landscape in the catchment is uh, representative of uh, the agricultural landscape uh, in the Czech Republic. As you can see, there's also a photo uh, from our catchment to give you a general idea how does it look like. Um, probably because of the angle, it seems a bit flat from the photo, but uh, the catchment still has uh, like some hill slopes. Um, so uh, the motivation for setting up the catchment is to study the rainfall runoff, soil erosion, and water balance within the cultivated landscape. So if we go to the next slide, I will show you a bit more detail of our catchment. Uh, as we can see the picture on the right side, the catchment is uh, only joined by one string in the middle. Uh, we set up the gouging station at the catchment outlet to observe the string runoff and suspended sediment. Close, uh, close to the gouging station, we have some piezometers to measure the shallow groundwater level and um, uh, weather station to monitor the meteorological data. Besides for other meteorological monitorings, we, uh, there are two more ring gouges and two new deployed meteorological stations distributed in the catchment. Uh, for, so, for the soil moisture monitoring, we measured the um, uh, soil moisture at point scale at the outlet and in the middle of the catchment, close to the power line, as you can see in the map. Uh, also, we have two uh, cosmic array sensors to monitor the soil moisture dynamics at the field scales. Uh, in addition, we have also uh, have conducted, conducted a field service, uh, including remote sensing, uh, rainfall simulation, soil sampling, and geophysics service and flood wave experiment in the stream. Uh, next slide, please. Um, here I will show you some new devices we have just installed recently. Uh, on the left side, as you can see, they are the cosmic ray sensors I mentioned before. Uh, we installed them in the last autumn. Uh, on the right side, uh, this month, we have just installed two meteorological stations for EP measurement. Uh, in this year, we are planning to further equip our catchment. Uh, we're going to install five to seven piezometers around the power line, and a dense network of soil moisture sensors to monitor the spatial distribution of the soil moisture, and also a new gouging station in the middle of the string to measure the discharge, sediment, and the water quality. Plus, we are planning to analyze the stable isotopes in the catchment. Uh, next slide, please. You have about two and a half minutes left. Okay, thanks. Um, now I will tell you some activities we have been running in the catchment. Uh, on the left photo, it's the wave experiment we did uh, to analyze the sediment resuspension in the stream. Uh, also, by using the long-term monitoring, uh, we analyzed the storm runoff generation mechanism in the stream. Uh, for the spatial analysis, we conducted some field surveys to analyze the spatial uh, distribution of soil water content in topsoil. Uh, besides, we also applied numeric modeling tools like uh, Hydra's uh, SWAT mic sheet to simulate uh, the water flow within the catchment. Uh, my colleague Nina just uh, published uh, research recently on the effects of uh, biofuel crop adoption on uh, water balance by using SWAT modeling. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, uh, the last but not least, uh, I will show you what kind of data are available in our catchment. As you can see the picture, uh, this is how the data look like. First, the meteorological data, including precipitation and uh, temperature. And then we have the temporal soil moisture data from two locations, uh, as I mentioned before, um, uh, at the outlet, also at the, uh, in the middle of the catchment. Um, also, we have the cosmic data, uh, 
but the, we have data from last September, uh, but the, the, the cosmic probe has not been calibrated yet. Um, except that we have uh, hydrologic data such as stream runoff and, uh, and sediment available from 2014 and uh, 2020. Um, next slide, please. Um, so if you are interested in our data and research, uh, you can check out the information on the website or you can contact me and my, or my supervisor, David, directly. I can touch the email here. Uh, we are looking forward to any kind of cooperation. Uh, thanks for your attention. That's all from my side. <laughs> Thank you, Talon. We have time for a question, I believe. Um, none have been posed yet. Um, but okay. can you tell me what the uh, footprint of the cosmic... Uh, uh, approaches like how big of an area and how deep in the soils it goes. Oh, the cosmic ray is sort of measures the um, uh, the soil the soil moisture at the field scale. It's about uh, the range around uh, 200 to 300 meter uh, radius of the 200 to 200 to 300 meters, and the depth is uh, around um, 40 centimeters to about um, about uh, 10 centimeters depth. Okay, what's the possible scan rate on that? How, how often can you make a measurement? Oh, it's uh, one uh, almost, you know, um, it's recorded um, 15 minutes, every 15 minutes. Great, thank you. Time to move on. Yeah, thanks. Great, thanks, Tyler. So our next speaker is Dave Goodrich. Talking about well, the LTAR. Yep. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the introduction. I really want to thank the organizers and Quasi for this uh, a whole set of sessions. I think it's a real benefit to the community. So uh, again, thank you. So I'm going to give a very high level presentation of the long term agro ecosystem research network, or LTAR. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but for this audience, I'm going to concentrate on the ARS experimental watershed network that underlies many of the LTAR sites due to its history uh, and experience, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So each date you see in the upper left-hand corner of the photos are the date in which data began to be collected at the various locations. And those locations with you know, a single date are continuing uh, to carry on. And you can see we've got a wide range uh, of, from snow dominated to surface water dominated uh, groundwater dominated, and then a, a bunch of different production systems. Next slide, please. So the Aris watersheds had their roots in the Dust Bowl uh, with the then Soil Conservation Service. And it got a big jump start in 1959 uh, when the Senate document established six watershed research centers and a central national goal that's um, shown on the slide you know, very applicable to uh, most any watershed and trying just to figure things out. Uh, the watersheds have collected data on over 600 watersheds. And there's a data repository at the Hydrology and Remote Sensing Lab in Beltsville uh, that's current to all of these watersheds to about 1992 with over 16,000 station years. We currently operate about 120 gauge watersheds and many of those are nested within larger watersheds. And each one of the watershed centers has a published overview introduction and data papers in the special sections of various journals. So uh, that gives you a lot more details uh, about how the data was collected, where it can be found. Uh, and both that information and the websites to access the databases will be in the uh, special issue that's coming up. And uh, you know, with, with some you know, supervised, I guess, searching, uh, we, we've tried to estimate that there's been over 12,000 papers abstracts that have used observations from these watersheds. And that's detailed in the recently published WRR paper uh, on the social benefits of watersheds. Next slide, please. You have about three minutes, Dave. Next slide. So, you know, what does this network give us? It gives us a stable, high quality research platform 
Uh, again, these have been operating quite a while. A, a range of hydroclimatic conditions, and just as an example, we see mean annual runoff uh, on the Y scale versus drainage area on the X scale. And the black star corresponds to the Mahantango watersheds uh, down at the bottom with a consistent gaining environment. The Riesel Texas watersheds with the red star are almost neutral and the Walnut Gulch watershed in Southeast Arizona is definitely an influent or, or losing watershed. Most of the watersheds are making dense observations in time and space uh, from sort of the hectare scale to almost 600 square kilometers. You know, and you know, given they've been there, given that they're, they are actually the research watersheds and not just data collection watersheds, we have a good process-based understanding uh, and a good knowledge base. So these have, this has led to a lot of um, collaborations and interdisciplinary field campaigns. And these watersheds have served as ground validation sites for numerous satellite products. And by design, many are privately owned, so we have to work with the producers. Next slide, please. So why are we expanding from the experimental watersheds to LTAR? And that really has to do with agriculture has to be transformed to meet the needs of what nine to, I've heard nine and a half billion in projected global population by 2050. And there was a National Academy report uh, cited at the bottom and the covers up at the top that posed these questions and many of these questions were used in the formulation of the LTAR mission. Next slide, please. So the vision for the network is how can we sustainably intensify agriculture? Our mission is to provide a network for developing national strategies to intensify ag. And purpose is to sustain a land-based infrastructure for research, education, and outreach. And the, Primary objectives, again, how do we intensify ag, but also how do we maintain and enhance ecosystem services on ag lands? And how do we enhance rural prosperity, which is bringing in the social science element? So the, the centralized data archive will go through the National Ag Library, both for historical or legacy data uh, from the existing watersheds, as well as new data collection. Next slide, please. Oops, one back. You're out of time. Okay, uh, any rate, we are intramurally funded and our intent is to operate this, water, this network with 30 to 50 years with shared research protocols and data collection pro protocols. And you know the network has been uh, expanded now with some biological stations and several universities involved too. So thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, great. We'll move. Thank you, Dave. We'll move on to uh, Melissa Rose, who was going to speak earlier in the series. Uh, she was unable to, but we're putting her in here, even though her talk is not quite on, on theme, but she's, she'll be talking about a hydrology topic on UAVs. Go, go ahead, Melissa. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Rose. I'm a first year PhD student in the remote sensing and geoinformatics lab at Northern Arizona University. Um, I'm excited to share with you today one of the ongoing projects in our lab using unmanned aerial vehicles to correlate trends in vegetation cover and water yield at the Sierra Ancha Experimental Forest. I would first like to thank two of my collaborators, my advisor, Dr. Tim Keyes, and Jackson Leonard, who is the lead ecologist at the Sierra Ancha. Melissa, we're not hearing you very well. Can you put your mouth a little closer to the microphone, please? Yeah, okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that's better, thank that's better. you. Okay, sorry about that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the Sierra Ancha Experimental Forest is located in central Arizona within the larger Tonto National Forest, marked here by the Black Star near the center of the map. Next, please. Sierra Ancha was first established in 1925 to examine mechanisms influencing sedimentation and storm flow, which were thought to have been threatening the structural integrity then recently constructed Theodore Roosevelt Dam downstream. And since then, Sierra Ancha has been conducting watershed management research for nearly a century and has retained a number of historic records relating to runoff, precipitation, snow cover, and climate, some of which that date back to the 1930s. 
please speak up. Uh, we're still having trouble hearing you. Okay, um, sorry about that. Uh, this clip takes us on a virtual tour through Sierra Ancha's 1400 meter elevational gradient, starting at approximately 1000 meters in elevation, where the landscape is dominated by semi-desert shrub. And as we move up, we see vegetation transition to ponderosa pine and mixed conifer forest reaching 2400 meters in elevation at Aztec Peak here, the highest point in Sierra Ancha. And our study site is this watershed outlined here in yellow called the Workman Creek Watershed. Next, please. So the Workman Creek Watershed uh, is divided into three separate wa sub watersheds, the North Fork outlined here in red, Middle Fork outlined here in yellow and South Fork outlined here in blue. These three forks each previously went through a series of independent experimental treatments comparing the impacts of different forest management strategies on watershed hydrology between 1939 and 1983. Then in 2000, a high severity wildfire swept through Workman Creek developing moderate to strong water repellent soil and minimal vegetative ground cover in certain areas making the bare soil more susceptible to runoff and erosion in response to rainfall. Our goal is to now build on data collected from these previous studies to evaluate recruitment dynamics in the watershed after the wildfire estimate changes in vegetation composition and determine how these changes affect the associated hydrology. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a brief overview of the instruments at our study site. Each tributary is instrumented with its own weir and settling basin to measure water yield and sedimentation separately for each fork, making the watershed an ideal site for comparative analysis of water yields. The middle fork was also instrumented with a snow tell station, which has recorded precipitation and snowfall continuously since 1983. The watershed also hosts the Campbell Scientific Weather Station, which has been collecting daily climate data since 2000. Next, please. Uh, in addition to these long-term data sets, in 2018, members of our lab collected high-resolution multispectral UAV imagery of the watershed. 22 centimeter resolution imagery was collected across four spectral bands in the green, red, red edge, and near-infrared portions of the spectrum. And in addition, we also obtained structure for motion data, which reconstructs the three-dimensional canopy uh, from a series of two-dimensional images. Next, please. You have about two and a half minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, the three-dimensional structure from motion point cloud data is shown on the left, and we derived height data for each individual tree in the watershed uh, by rasterizing the image on, uh, that you can see on the right. Uh, next, please. Uh, so coupling the long-term hydrology data sets with our UAV data, we hope to address the following questions. First, we would like to know how historic vegetation changes from previous studies have impacted water yield and soil erosion. We also would like to know if and how vegetation composition has changed in response to the 2000 Coon Creek wildfire. And then lastly, we would like to compare trends in vegetation dynamics with water yield and soil erosion in the watershed over the past 50 years. Next, please. Um, this just gives a brief overview of the steps we plan to take to address those questions. And we are currently finishing up our UAV classification and next, we'll be moving on to a subpixel classification so we can combine our high resolution UAV classification with Landsat satellite imagery to create a time series of classified vegetation maps at our study site. Next, please. Um, and so, this is uh, on the left is a false color composite of our final UAV image, which included 28 bands, including the original spectral bands, the structure for motion band, some texture variables, and relevant vegetation indices. And the spectral signatures for our nine different land cover types are. Uh, illustrated on the right. Next, please. So to classify the watershed, um, we decided to take a machine learning approach using a random forest classification, which resulted in a validation accuracy of 92%. The classified map is displayed here, and you can see the regions of the different land cover types throughout the watershed. Next, please. So after finalizing our UAV classification, um, we are next going to move on to correlating our classification with Landsat imagery and create a 50 year archive of classified maps. So we can then compare metrics for vegetation composition with the corresponding historic hydrology measurements that we have uh, within the Workman Creek watershed. And with that, um, next slide, please. I think we might be out of time for questions, but I'm happy to respond to questions in the chat and at the end of the, the rest of this, the talks today. We do have one, oh, looks like we need to move on. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Melissa. And uh, next up, we have Beth Nielsen. So we're moving into the urban part of the uh, talks. And some of these watersheds uh, start out in the headwaters, but move into urban areas. But go ahead, Beth. So 
Sorry about that. Thank you for the uh, invitation and the opportunity to talk today. I'd like to start by acknowledging our funding sources and all the prior and current faculty and students that have contributed to the establishment of the Logan River Observatory. Next. To get a sense of the area, this picture shows the USU campus in the valley looking up Logan Canyon that drains the Logan River. Next. The Logan River watershed is primarily made up of a mountainous canyon area with karst geology that is primarily forest and rangeland. The urban and agricultural areas in the valley shown by the black box on the left contain an extensive canal network that has significant impacts on stream flow and water quality because we divert significant amounts of water from the river. There are large karst springs in the canyon that provide drinking water and are a primary source of in-stream flow and precipitation falls primarily as snow, resulting in the snow-dominated snow hydrograph. Next. The LRO was, the LRO is my abbreviation for Logan River Observatory, was initially built by the, an NSF-funded infrastructure grant that focused on understand, understanding mountain-to-valley transitions. While the initial aquatic and climate side infrastructure was installed, as funding ran out, we knew that we needed to come up with different approaches for continuing data collection. Next. It was at that point that we formed the Logan River Observatory and began partnering with local entities. This included Logan City and Cache Water District. And together we approached the Utah State Legislature to provide partial funds to maintain the infrastructure and data collection. Next. As part of reaching out to the legislature and eventually receiving these funds, there was a clear need to illustrate the value of our data and and its ability to address local water related concerns and communicate how these findings were transferable statewide and even worldwide. Along these lines, the scope of the Logan River Observatory benefits were classified into three categories, information, education, and understanding. Next. Before talking about these categories, I wanted to show the current data collection locations throughout the LRO. As detailed in the upcoming data note, we have a series of flow and water quality and water and climate stations in the canyon, and this includes tributaries and springs. We also have a higher density of flow and water quality stations in the valley due to our need to understand the intense urban and agricultural influences in this small fraction of the watershed. Next. Going back to discussing information, education, and understanding, I'll first focus on how we provide information. The data we collect are provided near real time via HydraShare with daily updated CSV files and web-based mapping and plotting tools for time series. We also provide access to reports, publications, and theses that have analyzed subsets of these data. Next. You have about three minutes. Thank you. To manage the LRO data, we're using cyber infrastructure components that are community developed and widely available. This is the data workflow that provides the near time, the near real time data on the web that is really important to the people on the other end. Next. This slide shows in some example data where flow is plotted at three locations over the basin using these web based plotting tools. The Franklin Basin site represents the headwaters. The Utah Water Research Laboratory site represents the transition from the mountain portion, the mountainous portion of the watershed to the valley and the Menden Road a site represents the cumulative impact of the urban and agricultural valley portion of the watershed. These data illustrate the flow that our flow rates vary significantly within the year, between years, and over the basin. The agricultural and urban impacts can also be seen at Menden Road in green as during low flows, the, it, the flow at Menden Road approaches the Franklin Basin uh, flow rates in the headwaters shown in orange, and this is all post spring runoff during the growing season. Next. In terms of education, we're working to make the Logan River an outdoor, uh, the Logan River Observatory an outdoor classroom and continue to incorporate LRO data into both graduate and undergraduate classes. Next. Similar to many areas in the state, Cache County, where Logan City is located, is facing future water demands that exceed current or potentially future water availability. In the context of understanding, we're focusing on helping local entities understand how to address our future water shortages. And this has led to many of our current research questions. Next. Our research questions have focused primarily on water supply, water quality, and water, water management decisions. This includes trying to understand how karst aquifer exchanges with the Logan River influences in-stream flow and water availability. 
It also includes trying to understand how karst aquifer exchanges uh, are influenced by our snow distributions and snow and recharge of our karst aquifer and how these connections di dictate river flow and water availability. And finally, in the valley, we've studied how urban and agricultural source inflows uh, help maintain river flow downstream of our large irrigation diversions. Next. To date, our primary focus has been on taking, uh, taking the first steps to understand hydrologic connectivity as shown by some of our recent related papers. We've also updated our infrastructure based on research questions that have been primarily posed by us at the university, but also are being forced by community partners. And we anticipate this will be our approach in the future. And with that, I will take any questions. Thanks, Beth. Um, Jan Seibert asks mm -hmm. about the uh, one of the two of the records uh, being relatively noisy for the runoff. And can you explain the why they're so spiky relative to the other one? Well, some of the some of the variability down low in the watershed has to do with. Um, the way we move water in the lower watershed due to diversions, um, power, uh, hydropower influences, and even some research at the Water Research Lab where we use some of that water to do experiments. So that's part of it. Um, up higher, there's, there's other potential um, intermittent or ephemeral tribu tributaries that kind of turn on and turn off at different times. Great. So we must be ready to move on since Julie is displaying the slide. Thank you, Beth. Thank you. And uh, next up is Jennifer Shaw, which will be talking also about Utah. Go ahead, Jennifer. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. The title of my talk has changed somewhat. The new version is the take home message of my presentation. In short, coincident collection of data related to stabilized tips of water and hydrochemistry are useful for understanding where water resources are derived and how the sources of water influence its quality. So I will share with you four examples related to studies of surface waters, tap waters, and vapor, uh, water vapor conducted within the Wasatch Environmental Observatory, or WEO for short. Next slide, please. <laughs> WEO is comprised of a consortium of scientists from the University of Utah who manage fixed and mobile research infrastructure to monitor climate, meteorology, hydrochemistry, atmospheric trace gas, and ecology within the 2000 85 kilom square kilometer Jordan River Basin, which includes Salt Lake City and Salt Lake County. WEO is funded by entities shown at the base of the slide, many of whom are also collaborative partners who manage research infrastructure, augmenting WEO resources. In week two of this series, Paul Brooks shared details about the geography of this region and long-term records of discharge and climate that inform the more recent work I will describe today. The inset of this slide, outlined in red, shows Red Butte Creek, one of the seven sub-catchments drained to the Jordan River and the Great Salt Lake from the central Wasatch Range situated east of Salt Lake City. It is home to the University of Utah. Red Butte Creek is instrumented with a sensor network called the Gradients Along Mountain to Urban Transitions, or GAMET, which evolved concurrent with the Logan River Observatory described by Beth in the previous talk. Next slide, please. Next. Thank you. Gamut uh, consists of sensors that have continuously monitored stage height using a Campbell scientific pressure transducer and water chemistry using YSI XO2 sons, forest technology turbidity sensors, and seabird scientific SUNA sensors in 15 minute intervals at eight locations since 2013 along Red Butte Creek, which extends from a protected U.S. Forest Service research natural area in its headwaters and then flows through the University of Utah campus in Salt Lake City before reaching its terminus at the fourth order main stem Jordan River. So Red Butte Creek is representative of the wildland or urban land use gradient common to the seven subcatchments of this region, which is home to almost 1.2 million people and growing. Next, please. Continuously monitored data have been augmented with episodic synoptic sampling to analyze stream solutes and water stabilized tubes isotopes, including deuterium and O18. The graphs on this slide show the wildland to urban gradient on the x-axis going from left to right, with the colors below the water isotopes figure in the center corresponding to the colors in the solutes figure on the right. The upper central graphs show the local meteoric water line in the solid black line, which is derived from rainwater samples. It also shows uh, site-specific deuterium O18 relationships, which support the idea that groundwater-derived stream flows associated with snow melt, 
and leads to the um, chemostasis that Paul described in week two. Note that in the box plots below, the mean DEL values for both deuterium and O18 become more enriched at lower urban sites relative to montane sites. And these are concomitant with increased nitrate. So these data indicate that the urban aquifer is polluted possibly by leaking sewer pipes, which carry enriched water from culinary sources and high loads of dissolved nitrate. Next slide, please. You have about two and a half minutes. Thank you. Okay, next slide. Water stable isotopes from 800 spatially distributed tap water samples collected from Salt Lake County um, also indicate that montane winter precipitation is a key source from tap water, uh, as indicated by the black lines in the upper two um, graphs of that central panel. Um, these DEL values of deuterium and 018 are consistent with the values observed for snow and stream flow at montane sites in the previous slide. Um, but these figures, um, the colors in this panel, I should say, and on the map on the left represent samples collected from different regions of the county that are isotopically similar to one another. So together these figures show that spatiotemporal variation in water isotopes resulting from a balkanized leaky distribution system and the switching or mixing of water sources by some service providers. Um, the map on the right then shows the predicted distribution of source waters when the data from water isotopes are combined with service provider district boundaries. Next slide, please. The Jordan River, which runs through the heart of Salt Lake City, is a highly engineered system with multiple tributary and canyon canal inflows, diversions, and direct effluent inputs from three water reclamation facilities. You can see that central photo depicts the confluence of an effluent discharge point with the river on the right. Perhaps not surprisingly, this river is designated as a federally impaired waterway. Synoptic seasonal water sampling collected uh, 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 water sampling, which we collected during base flow from multiple locations along the Jordan River, um, and potential source water samples were analyzed for deuterium in 018, and then incorporated into a Bayesian network analysis to predict the proportion of river discharge attributed to different sources of water at each study site. Um, we found um, in the results shown in the figure on the right um, that there are shifts in dominant water sources along the flow path and seasonally, which help to explain variation in water chemistry associated with river impairment. Next slide, please. Few of us think of water vapor as part of catchment science, yet this is an important consideration rapidly urbanizing semi-arid to arid regions. Continuous monitoring of deuterium and O18 in water vapor, atmospheric CO2 concentrations, and specific humidity in the urban core of Salt Lake City suggests that five to 10% of urban water vapor is derived from fossil fuel combustion. And this evidence comes from low values of DXS, which is an index derived from deuterium and O18 DEL values that can be used to identify water vapor source regions. And these values are possible only with the inclusion of combustion end members and mixing models. The study shows an inverse relationship between DXS values and above ground or above background atmospheric CO2, which is most prominent when we have thermal inversions forming during persistent cold air pool events that trap the products of fossil fuel combustion at the surface boundary later layer. Next slide. Thank you. Um, You're out of time. Uh, Can you finish okay. up, please? Yes. Um, the, the data from the examples I shared today are public, uh, publicly available from the HydroShare and Water Isotopes databases and the DOI shown up in this slide. And I'd like to thank all the current WIO investigators and cooperating agencies listed here, as well as past WIO affiliates. Um, I'll put my contact information in the chat, and I'll entertain any questions if there's time. Great. Unfortunately, there is not time, and we're going to thank you, Jennifer, and we're going to move right on to Adam Wymore, who's going to take us to New Hampshire. Go ahead, Adam. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, thank you very much for the invitation um, and the chance to talk about the Lamprey River Hydrological Observatory. Next slide, please. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement and recognition that the Lamprey River Hydrological Observatory is located on the traditional lands of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki people. And we acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and water, which is called Nebi, and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. Next slide, please. The observatory has been operating continuously since uh, 1999 and um, located in the southeast corner of New Hampshire. It's where our experimental design is a nested uh, tributary design uh, flowing into the six order main stem Lamprey River, which ultimately discharges into a local estuary known as uh, the Great Bay. We use the term suburbanization to describe the fact that most of the watershed is still 
intact forest, but within it is a matrix of natural wetlands and increasing human development and agriculture. Next slide, please. The story here regionally is one of nitrogen impairment. The Lamprey River, as well as other rivers, discharge into the Great Bay Estuary, which has a vibrant and economically important oyster, oyster fishery. But the Great Bay is in violation of the Clean Water Act due to nitrogen impairment, as shown by the red on this figure. Next slide, please. So that was really the basis for our original motivating questions, which focuses on the role of suburbanization and changing land use as drivers of long-term trends in surface water chemistry, groundwater chemistry, and nitrogen uh, balance. Next slide, please. But like any good observatory, we also have to be able to recognize new emerging questions. And for us, that is what is the effect of changing seasonality and climate variability on watershed biogeochemical processes within the suburbanized lands landscape. And for us, that looks like um, a shortening winter and earlier on spring onset and increases in summer drought. Next slide, please. And I give us an example of the summer drought, the drought that we just went through uh, the summer and fall arguably are still in, but you can see with the red ribbon there from the on the map that the drought was really cent centered over um, southeastern New Hampshire and the observatory. And the uh, data here from a U.S. Drought Monitor uh, shows a drought in 2016 and 2020, and for the first time in these two droughts, we have a portion of the state in their extreme drought conditions, indicating that drought is becoming more frequent and intense in this region. Next slide, please. In the suburban area, because a lot of the homes here are um, within the forest, uh, a lot of people use on-site waste disposal or septic, and many homeowners are on private wells. Next slide, please. You have three minutes. Thank you. Um, if here, this is our hydrograph over the last 20 years, um, and within this, we've captured 200-year scale floods, which actually occurred back to back, and these pictures uh, represent those flood conditions. Next slide, please. The, story, the nitrogen story here, though, is really interesting because it's, it's a story of two types of nitrogen, nitrate and dissolved organic nitrogen, which both contribute about equal portions to the total dissolved nitrogen pool. Next slide, please. So what this means is we have to think about both forms of nitrogen. And you can see with the figure that um, on the top right, as human pop population density increases, DIN output increases. And the green figure on the bottom shows the relationship between wetlands and organic nitrogen. So we see both fingerprints of, the, of human, humans and natural landscape features. We also have a chloride story here with impervious cover um, and approaching toxicity levels often in summer. Uh, next slide, please. We also operate a network of high frequency in situ sensors. And so the panel C here is a, a seven year record of 15 minute interval nitrate data from the main stem of the lamprey. Next slide, please. The sensor network um, is throughout south, southeastern New Hampshire um, within the observatory and some other sites, including towards Manchester, but we also operate sensors in the White Mountains. Um, and this, of course, allows us to start um, incorporating the role of storms and extreme events in material export. Next slide, please. And just for a quick example, two recent papers show some of the concentration discharge dynamics as monitored by sensors. You can see with the figure on the left how hysteresis patterns change uh, with forest versus suburban land use, and also with winter and summer seasonal patterns. The figure on the right, um, just published this past year, shows intra-annual variability in concentration discharge relationships and how that varies with land use. Next slide, please. And then summary just to, of our, the data that we maintain, uh, our weekly grab sample data going back roughly 20 years has a heavy um, focus on nutrients, including carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. We also monitor all major cations and anions, and we have a growing library of greenhouse gases. The weekly grab sample data is maintained at the Environmental Data Initiative and our high frequency sensor network, which includes YSI EXOs and SUNAs is uh, stored at HydroShare. And I will put my contact information in the chat. Thank you. Does this mean we're out of time? We have 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, quick question? 
You do a yes or no question, that means. <laughs> Will you continue monitoring? Yes. Yes. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to move on to Peter Groffman, who will take us to a very urban center, Baltimore. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah, so um, what a wonderful series of talks this has been over the past few weeks. I'm delighted to participate, and I wanted to thank the organizers for, for organizing this. This is everything we're supposed to be doing. Um, now I'm going to talk about some ur urban work, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge um, my collaborators as part of this National Science Foundation-funded Baltimore Ecosystem Study which is a component of the long-term ecological research network. Uh, next one, please. And I'd like to cover three topics, right? I'd like to say a little bit about the, the three key driving factors uh, in urban watersheds, which are impervious surface, impervious surface, and impervious surface. So I thought maybe I'd say a little <laughs> bit about impervious surface. Um, and then more generally, talk about um, you know, long-term, that, that urban watersheds, we, we learn a lot. I think that, that urban watersheds should be part of our catchment studies. I think we're learning fundamental things. Um, about catchments in urban uh, in urban stu studies using, especially with long-term data. And I'd like to say a little bit about the fourth important factor in urban watersheds, which I think we overlook because of our focus on impervious surface, uh, which is groundwater. So if I have the next one, please. Uh, so just a little bit about where is Baltimore. Um, I guess you, can you, I don't know if you all can see my pointer, but you can see uh, in, the, in, the, this is in the Northeast US, you can see uh, Hubbard Brook is up at the top of this figure over here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and then you can see uh, Washington, D.C. is down there, and you can see hooligans attacking the capital of our nation there in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Mostly what you'll notice um, in, in that picture is red, which is impervious surface, and this is perhaps the most urban, uh, high impervious part of North America. So if I can go to the next slide, please. And this is what impervious surface does. So here's just a basic hydrograph, and, and, and you put impervious surface in watersheds, and the, the water flows over the impervious surface and it rushes into the stream and you get these really high flows, these a these, uh, lot of energy degrading flows um, and, uh, and it causes physical, chemical, biological degradation of the system. But then you also, and then we pay less attention to this, but you, you kind of starve the groundwater and so you get reductions in base flow. And we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, next, please. So, the biogeochemistry of these urban watersheds is a little more complex than the simplicity of, of just, just impervious surface. So here we have nitrate on the, on the y-axis, um, 20 years of nitrate data um, in three different streams. And we always have a forested reference stream down at the bottom is very low nitrate levels comparable to many of the other catchments we've heard about. Um, we have an ag catchment at the top, which is all comparable to many of the ag catchments we've heard about. Um, we said very high nitrate, but our focus is the middle. Um, that, that, that's, that, that suburban stream here. And, and why, and, and, and in these studies, like in many catchment studies, the long-term data is a platform for asking questions. Why are the nitrate concentrations clearly higher than the forest and clearly lower than the ag? What's controlling the long-term decline that we see? What's controlling the seasonal pattern? And, and, it, and, and, and I'll argue that the long-term data um, provides this platform for addressing complex questions, both in urban science, but then also in, in just basic catchment science. Next, please. And one of the, the ones that we've gone after is the interaction between land use and climate. So, so as we see in many of our catchments, as precipitation goes up or as discharge, which is on the x-axis, discharge goes up, retention of nitrogen goes down. And it's real obvious in the urban watersheds, you can see in the middle there, the yellow one is an ag watershed, the red one is a dense, dense urban watershed. But you even see it, it's a significant decline in the forested watershed at the top. And, and again, something that's so obvious in the urban watersheds, it, it helps you to, to say, well, what are the mechanisms driving the decline in retention? And how do those mechanisms apply um, in the forested and the ag watersheds as well as the urban watersheds? So the urban study is really helping us find them out. Next one, please. And then I just wanted to say a little bit about groundwater. You know, so we focus on impervious surface, we, we, we focus on runoff, and we forget that there's groundwater in urban systems. And uh, some of our scientists like Claire Welty and Sujay Koshal and John Duncan have been focusing on, on groundwater. And you know, when the, when the floods stop, um, there's a whole lot of groundwater in the system. The groundwater levels vary seasonally, uh, and there's lots of complex interactions between sources of pollutants, like the leaking sewers here, and sinks. Like riparian denitrification, so and and so, um, so we need to pay more attention to groundwater. I think the place we really see it uh, is with salt. So if I go to the next one, urban watersheds are salty, especially in places where it snows. 
and we use uh, row de-icing. So you, so you can see here at the bottom, uh, the line is, our, is chloride concentrations in our, in our uh, forested watershed, they're very low, they're very stable. But in the exurban watershed, you can see they're just going up like crazy. And it's not snowing more in Baltimore, and they're not using more road salt, but the chloride concentrations continue to go up. So the salt concentrations are rising at a remarkable rate. And the next one, please. Um, but not at the same rate in all our streams. So the line on the bottom there is that exurban watershed I just showed you. But it's the, there the salt concentrations are rising much slower than they are in the, the more dense urban watershed. And, and we think this has everything to do with groundwater. And the next one, please. But the, the rate of increase um, is, in, in, is, is greater in streams that have less surface water groundwater interaction because the, the salt in the stream is interacting with the groundwater and there's creating a huge legacy. Uh, and so we think that this groundwater surface water interaction, which is important in all our catchments, is really going to be important in these urban watersheds controlling the uh, kind of the long term legacy dynamics in a lot of these systems. We need to think about that. Um, urban watersheds are fun. I think we. I think they're. They're. It's just great to have them included in this. In this. In this catchment science session, because we learn fundamental things about about catchments, um, and uh, and and especially if we can, if we can get long term data. I also think that the urban watersheds give us an opportunity to expand our science. Right. So there, there's a lot of stakeholders who are interested in urban watersheds. We're interested in diversifying the people involved in the geosciences. Urban uh, watersheds are a way to do that. Uh, and then lots of policy relevant questions. So I I'm excited about um, talking about urban watersheds. That's all. Thank you, Peter, and all of our panelists today. Um, there's no direct questions of Peter at this time. So I think we'll just move on into the, the general discussion here. And at this point, we'll have a hopefully a good 10 minutes of discussion. Um, please do enter your, your topics in the chat and we will hope, hope to address as many as we can. One thing that uh, Stephen Burgess brought up is that he noticed in, in photos that many of us uh, are using uh, above ground precipitation collectors. And he's pointing out that um, there's some, he's pointing out the, the known bias of those. And I think he just wants folks to acknowledge and to, to discuss how they may be able to better their measurements by trying different techniques, particularly particularly in using pit uh, type rainfall collectors rather than above ground rainfall collectors. Does anyone have any insight that they wanna provide on that, that topic? Uh, I mean, it, just speaking for myself while our panelists get some ideas, um, you know, in some, some places they're not practical. So at our research, we do a lot of uh, work on peatland ecosystems and you just simply can't uh, sink the, those type of collectors in. So it might just be uh, inherent ecosystem property that, that some of us will be able to use them or not. Another is just the, the inherent legacy of using these instruments and keeping maintaining the same measurement, knowing that there's a possible bias or that there is a bias, but still mean, maintaining some consistency over time. And Dave Goodrich may really be able to talk on that topic given the length of records that he was showing. Yeah, we, uh, we want to put our long-term records in context. So about 10 years ago, at Steve's suggestion, we put in uh, three pit gauges paired with our above ground gauges in uh, varying degrees of uh, topographic roughness, if you will. And, you know, as expected, the more roughness you get, the larger undercatch you get. You know, level area ranges from about seven to eight percent uh, going up to 10, 11, and then at the more extreme case, up to 15% of uh, Steve comment. So, so yeah, I mean, in, a, in a, an environment like ours where the runoff to rainfall ratio is very low, often under 1%, you know, you can't put your water balance in context unless you take uh, the undercatch into account. Great, any, any other follow-up on that point? I'm just looking forward burn. to getting rid of my rain gauges altogether. Um, you know, the, you see these advancements in using NEXRAT radar to, to, to develop these very high resolution precipitation fields. Um, and I think we should, we, should, we should push for that. You know, the way you think about it, the, when you see those fields and then you think about running around with these rain gauges, you realize it's kind of an old fashioned way of doing things and there ought to be a way to, 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 to get those data better more. 
Well, then right. Dave, Dave here again, you get um, radar has its own issues. So you're typically looking at a piece of the sky, probably a minimum of five kilometers up. And, you know, in our dry environment, we get evaporation from that higher level uh, down to the gauge level. So, and in the West, you've got a lot of radar blockage because of the mountains too. So, you know, pick your poison. <laughs> it's not here today. It's definitely not here today. But it, it's, it's uh, if we like, if we want to be looking yeah, to the yeah. future, I think it's exciting. Agreed. Yeah, you're right. This is a good general question. So Katie Walton Day is asking, are there analogies that can be drawn between urban impervious watersheds and forested watersheds post wildfire? We're extrapolating to our other land uses that we've discussed today and, and how we might be able to, you know, use our watersheds as analog for other sites, which then relates to another general comment from Doug Burns about, you know, the best ways of extrapolating from one site to representativeness of other sites. Does anyone have anything to, to add to those topics? I think it's, you know, just important to, to remind ourselves that, you know, catchment studies are usually an N of one, which creates an obvious issue for extrapolation to other sites, but it also creates a landscape that we can control and that we can highly monitor. So there are benefits and, and drawdowns to that. But Dave, here again. Things, yeah, Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Well, we've always said that the things we see in urban watersheds are precursors to what's gonna happen in the rest of the world because you know, the temperatures rise and the precipitation intensity rises and and so our urban streams are physically degraded and um, they're chemically degraded and they're biologically degraded. And, as, as, and, and those trends, I think we're gonna see um, expanding across the landscape, especially as precipitation intensity increases, we're gonna see this kind of physical degradation of the stream, um, which, then, which then catalyzes a whole series of changes in terrestrial aquatic interactions. And so in many ways, um, the urban areas are, are just kind of precursors of what's happening across the rest of the landscape, just at a slower rate. Yeah, Dave here again. Uh, our post-fire watershed analysis, our, you know, the, the studies we've done where we've had good pre-fire rainfall runoff data versus post-fire is uh, the biggest adjustment is with the hydraulic roughness. So in that sense, just like you get rapid runoff in an urban area, uh, that's the same, and you know, ironically, we don't um, reduce the saturated hydraulic conductivity that much. Now, that that's important if you do have hydrophobicity, uh, but um, uh, we we just see a much more rapid runoff. Great. Uh, let's shift gears a little bit and, and talk about some of the aspects of UAVs. And Joy Jones is asking. Um, Melissa and others, you know, how can UAV detailed data be used to reconstruct past vegetation when combined with other, you know, past imagery sources? Um, and how can they be used to, re uh, to help with uh, understanding the role of vegetation and affecting hydrology? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, can you guys hear me a little bit better now? I try to bring my microphone a little bit closer. So hopefully this is... It's quite uh, good, thank you. Okay, yeah, sorry about earlier. Um, that's a great question. So with UAV imagery, um, we have one data set. It's for one, it's low temporal um, imagery. So we only have it for one time. Um, and so what we do is we take that and we are classifying it now. And then we can correlate that to um, upscale to Landsat imagery, which has a higher temporal frequency. And so um, the method that we do or that we use uh, to do this is called subpixel classification. So we take individual or spectra from individual land cover types and then um, now uh, upscale that to, to a 30 meter Landsat pixel and are able to then um, create a relative composition of what's represented in that, that larger 30 meter, 30 meter pixel. So we upscale to lower, lower spatial resolution but higher temporal resolution imagery. And then we're able to create a series, a, a image archive going back to um, the 1970s, which is when Landsat 1 first started and then are able to create these classified uh, vegetation maps uh, for several decades. And then from those classified vegetation maps, you can create metrics for um, relative composition of each land cover type, 
you can uh, calculate things like leaf area index and total crown um, canopy uh, area, and then uh, try to correlate some of those those quantitative metrics for the land the land cover um, analysis to the associated hydrology measurements. And so um, the first part of that, which um, in the uh, in my presentation um, from where the project is right now, it's very much a remote sensing site. But that once we have this uh, this data archive, we can then start compare to compare to see how potentially maybe an increased number um, of, of shrub type um, vegetation leads to more soil erosion, so, so, so on and so forth. So the first part is having to quantita uh, create quantitative metrics for the landscape um, and yeah, upscale UAV imagery to Landsat imagery. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, moving on to a, yet another topic, Jason Lee, Leach asked a question focused on urban watersheds, but I think I'm gonna expand it to both urban and ag. Um, what are the lessons learned from your studies that we can use to improve water planning and water conservation? And anyone, please hop in on this one, particularly anyone who hasn't spoken yet during this, this discussion. I can go ahead and jump in and just talk about uh, the, the study that we just are going to publish in this particular uh, special issue, we're looking at the different sources of um, ag and urban return water, whether it's surface or subsurface, and how that basically makes it so there is water in the river below these uh, pretty significant diversion structures. So there are places where we actually divert the entire river, and then we have to get water back in the river and the only source of that water is some of the um, locations where we have some poor water management or um, other activities that allow water back into the river. And so as we try to think about how we change our management of these urban and ag areas, there's the potential to actually continue to reduce flow in the river because our diversions may not adapt as we do different uh, water or we make different um, management decisions in our in these areas. Time is running short, but Jennifer, you added some comments and I think they'd be helpful to bring out in the full discussion here. Can you re reiterate those points from the chat? Sure, I'd be happy to Stephen. Um, but first I wanted to follow up on what Bethany just said. Um, we recognized in our study of the Jordan River that canal return flows at some points of the year and certain locations along the river are the dominant source of water back into even a fourth order river system. Um, and yet, and we know from other canal distribution systems in other places like um, New Mexico, for example, that canals can actually increase surface, um, subsurface, surface water interactions uh, and clean the water. Um, so I think that there's really, it's really an open question about how canals function within our urban uh, ecosystems and whether they're providing uh, sinks or sources for some of the nutrients and other pollutants that might be present in the water. Um, to respond to Jason Leach's question about, um, you know, urban planning, um, uh, I, I'm currently involved in, in research on a new green infrastructure facility that's part of the WIO, um, which has a series of experimental uh, bioswales planted with either mazic vegetative communities or more native drought tolerant communities. But in general, I think more green infrastructure in our urban ecosystems can help to minimize um, those pollutants that are entering surface waters. But we also, um, Going back to what Peter mentioned, we also really need to protect our groundwater sources because we saw even in the Salt Lake area that groundwater is an important contributor to both tributary flow um, as well as uh, main stem river flow. And so that means addressing leaky pipes and septic systems and potentially considering tertiary wastewater treatment. Great, thank you to all participants and all panelists. We're, we're at the end of our time here, I think I'll give Jamie a chance to hop in here with a couple points, but uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Steve. Um, all I want to do is announce that next week will be our final week, and we will be talking about different ideas on how to sustain catchments and how to collaborate with, the, with one another. So please attend, um, bring your ideas, get a lot of sleep the night before. We'll be having an early career panel and a, a less early career panel to give us insight and wisdom. We really are looking forward to the 
the early career uh, panelists to give their their vision on how we're going to keep going into the future, and um, the others to you know keep everyone amused and excited and uh, carrying on. So thanks again, and uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>